Hello, everybody. Let us start our second day for our virtual meeting. Now we have a pleasure to have a talk by Johanna Emmerger. She will tell us about complexity measures for geometric actions on the Rasora and Kasmudi orbits. Please, Johanna, 45 minutes. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, Ilina. So thanks very much for the invitation. And uh, certainly I would like to come to Moscow in person also at some point. But uh, for now, I think it's great that you organized this. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. And um, as you said, I'm going to talk about some recent work on complexity measures. And the talk will be based on this recent paper, which I wrote with two students, PhD student Marius Gerbershagen and uh, master student Annalena Weigel here in Würzburg. Uh, okay, so um, let me start with a motivation. So the talk will be about, uh, no, I can't see my mouse anymore. Anyway, I'll do without the mouse for now. So, um, so um, I will talk about new realizations of computational complexity and two-dimensional conformal field theories. Um, so I'm going to explain what computational complexity actually is. And um, so uh, this talk is uh, actually motivated by complexity proposals also in the context of black holes and wormholes, so more in the context of gravity. And um, so these were studied in the context with the ADS-CFT correspondence. And so uh, the idea is to implement this computational complexity also in conformal field theories, such that these gravity proposals may be tested using the ADS-CFT correspondence. And um, so the new aspects which I'm going to talk about in this talk is um, to investigate the use of symmetry transformations um, as so-called gates. So gates are the uh, unitary transformations which you perform on your states in the Hilbert space. And um, in particular, uh, the subject of the paper was to study complexity proposals which are related to such uh, so-called ge geometrical actions. So I'm going to explain what geometrical actions are as well. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention, if, if you would like to ask a question, please do so immediately. And I, I would be very happy to take any questions right away. OK, so uh, here you see the outline of my talk. Um, I'll give you first a very brief a review of computational complexity and quantum information, quantum field theory, and the ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, then I review some recent proposals for computational complexity for two-dimensional two conformal field theories. Uh, I then introduce you to geometric actions for quadron joint orbits. And then I present some applications both to Virasoro and Kasmudi groups and give some examples of how this works. And at the end, I'll explain what the relation to the ADS-CFT correspondence is. And uh, this actually closes with some open questions for the future. Okay, so let me start with complexity. So what is complexity? First of all, in, in quantum information, so uh, it's, a, it's a concept which really comes very hands-on from building quantum computers. And um, so what it really does is to consider a set of predefined unitary transformations in the Hilbert space. And then the question one asks is how many of these need to be applied to reach any given state from a reference state? So um, if you think of constructing a quantum computer, you might have a collection of 10 spins, say, and at the beginning you take them all to point upwards, say, and then uh, your experiment somehow defines a finite number of unitary transformations which you can apply, and then you can ask how many of these do I need to reach any other state in my Hilbert space. So uh, now we can put this uh, question into a slightly more formal framework, and which is given here. So we consider a reference state R and a set of unitary operators, uh, U1, U2, and so on. So there, there should be a finite amount of them. And uh, these are referred to as gates. Then uh, the complexity, which depends um, on, um, on a particular state, psi, 
is then given by the minimal number of these gates, which are required to map the reference state to this final state psi. And um, so this is usually defined up to a given tolerance, as you can see in the equation in the middle of the slide. So um, actually, so then you, you minimize this, um, this is expression given in the um, curly brackets in the middle in this equation up to a tolerance. Okay, so now this definition is uh, well defined for pure states in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but if we would like to use this definition to test complexity proposals in the context of the ADS safety correspondence, uh, we need an appropriate definition within quantum field theory. And the problem or the difference is that in quantum field theory, you have uh, an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And that means uh, that there's no standard definition for quantum field theories of this quantity. Now, this has been already um, a, a very active research topic for, say, the last three or four years. And uh, the, the beginning was to study free field theories uh, following Jefferson, Myers, Heller, and many other people um, who I don't have time to mention. So there's a, a really big research area working on this topic. And so for free field theories, there's actually a lot of proposals. However, if we want to use ADS-CFT, at some point we need interactions and even strong coupling. And this is, of course, a very challenging task. OK, so um, before I go into details about the quantum field theory, let me briefly introduce you to this so-called Nielsen's approach, so for which you see some references in the top right of the uh, paper. And um, <clears throat> so this is a, a very famous way of defining this complexity in, in for finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And uh, so this is a mathematically rigorous treatment for this case of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So, um, so Newton is an Australian mathematician and he suggested to estimate computational costs of quantum circuits um, in the following way. So those quantum circuits are these function u of tau. And uh, so these involve this inverse path ordering. Yeah, somehow on the first slide I was able to use my mouse, but uh, now somehow it disappeared. Also we have to do without me pointing anything. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, um, so this, if you look at this equation for u of tau, then you see this in the path ordering of um, an exponential, and then you see an integral from zero to tau. So zero would be the time at which you have your reference state, and tau will be the time when you reach um, your target state, and h will be some appropriate um, Hermitian operator. So then Nielsen suggested to estimate computational costs um, via metrics on the group manifold of unitaries. And um, so in this approach, um, there's a very, very elegant way of viewing complexity. And essentially, it has a geometric interpretation. And so I think that makes it very appealing also for ADS-CFT is this uh, geometric connotation of this quantity here now. So uh, in this geo uh, geometric approach, now the complexity is the length of the shortest geodesics between this original u of uh, time zero and uh, u of tau at the end. And uh, then the complexity is defined by this expression which you see at the bottom left. And uh, it involves this function curly f which depends on the Hermitian operators. And uh, f is the so-called cost function. So uh, that's a function which um, actually assigns a cost to a particular symmetry transformation if you want. And in, in the language of differential geometry, um, this metric is uh, usually a norm on the tangent space. And uh, so this equation which you see there then means that you view complexity as a cost action. So this is really, you can view this as an action uh, which describes a particle moving on a group manifold. And then the equation of motion which you get from this expression C will be the geodesic equation for this particle. And in fact, this geometric concept, this will go through the entire talk. And in particular, also when I talk about field theory, this will be extremely relevant. So we note this uh, cost function, which will play an important role later on. 
Okay, um, before I talk about conformal field theories, let me very briefly mention these proposals by Suskind et al. for um, a similar proposal within gravity, which is then used to understand uh, this time evolution of black holes and wormholes. So essentially, what, there are two different proposals of how to realize complexity for a black hole. And uh, which you can see here, one is on the left-hand side, one is on the right-hand side. So the left one is called the complexity equal uh, volume proposal. And uh, so in both proposals, one considers the evolution of two copies of a conformal field theory initially entangled in the thermal field double state as written at the top of the slide. And then now if you look at this complexity is equal to volume proposal, so we see this picture of global ADS. And so the boundaries of ADS are uh, the two sides. And um, then uh, you see um, these connections between, um, between the thermal field double states. And essentially then the complexity is viewed as the volume of the einstein rosen which between this uh, thermal field double state and um, one can actually show that this evolves linearly with time, which you actually would like for complexity to happen. Because you, um, you know, in, in every time step, one um, computational step should be taken. So then you expect uh, your complexity to be linear in time. So a, a similar or analogous realization, one which is slightly complementary, is this complexity is equal to action proposal. Uh, where one considers the gravitational action on the wheeler de Witt patch, which was drawn in, in this red uh, wheeler de Witt patch on the right hand side um, of the slide. So these are the two suggestions by Saskin in gravity, and these are the ones which we would like to test by mapping to it into a CFT uh, using the ADS CFT correspondence. So, in some sense, in the situation is that we're going slightly backwards in the sense that we have some well-defined proposal on the gravity side, but the dictionary entry on the, on the conformal field theory side is not yet known. Okay, so um, this brings us to this task that um, to uh, actually establish a, a rigorous ADS CFT dictionary, we have to define, to define computational complexity for quantum field theories. So, um, what we have to do is uh, de to define a set of gates, which in quantum field theory is likely to be a continuous set of gates. And then, of course, we also have to define uh, reference states. And, and that's also a challenging task in the quantum field theory. So, there have been many suggestions uh, involving, for instance, spatially unentangled states, motivated by this um, analogy with um, quantum information. Uh, however, today, because I'm going to talk about conformal field theories, what we're going to look at uh, highest weight states in a symmetry multiplet as our reference state. And then um, the cost, we also need to define a cost function which determines the expense of applying a particular gate. Okay, so um, now actually there is some very nice paper by Caputa and Margan, which is uh, the reference written at the top right in green. and um, so um, this is a, a very nice paper, which uh, actually um, did a lot of the work which I'm going to show to you and which was the basis also for our analysis, which I come to later on. And uh, so they found the following answers to the task of defining complexity for a two-dimensional conformal field theory. So first of all, um, they define a gate set and their idea is to use the conformal transformations themselves as gate transformations or as gates. And um, I should give a slight word of warning right at the beginning because um, at the beginning here, this is not a completely general approach which covers the entire Hilbert space, but essentially these uh, transformation will move you inside one gamma module or one uh, reducible representation of the conformal symmetry field. So in some sense, this is a little restrictive, but of course, uh, since the task is so difficult, it's very nice to have a very well-defined starting point. So that's the starting point we're going to take here as well. <clears throat> so now let me read you these equations, which you can see on the slide. So um, Caputa and Mangan, they define the conformal transformations, which um, 
um, and the gates associated to the conformal transformations uh, as this function q of t, uh, which is uh, given an integral over the sigma coordinate of some um, arbitrary function epsilon, um, which depends on time and the coordinate sigma. So uh, I should say we review here the, the conformal symmetry group uh, essentially as the group of uh, a cylinder. So we have a, a close the diffeomorphisms on the circle times a line. So that's why we have this coordinate T and sigma. And then T is the standard energy momentum tensor. So um, then uh, you can expand, use the uh, expansion in, in Virasoro generators, which is then written at the top right of this equation, of the first, so the, at the end of the first equation. Okay, so, and then in very, uh, in great analogy to the Nielsen paper, uh, now they define a unitary transformation U of T, which is uh, written in the second line. And uh, so you see an integral from zero to capital T. So this will be the end time uh, at which we analyze our uh, target state. And they integrate precisely over this symmetry transformation or this gate Q, which uh, was defined on the first line. So their reference state is a primary state, so which is labeled by H, so the conformal dimension of this um, highest weight state. And then the target space will be obtained by applying the unitary transformation at the time t is equal to t final. Okay, and then um, there's of course a certain choice in defining this cost function, which assigns a cost to um, performing a symmetry transformation. And um, so what they do um, is to take this expression for f, which is given at the bottom of the page. So uh, they take the expectation value of a gate with respect um, to this state which is given there. So, um, so the state ut acting on the reference state. And uh, so that's um, the cost function they work with. Are there any questions up to this stage? Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in your transformation, you have only one copy of Virasoro? Yes. Yes, okay. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's all in this chiral sector. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, um, I guess you can do the other sector independently. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a choice. And uh, as I said, um, this by no means covers the entire Hilbert space. And uh, we will see um, uh, aspects of this later on. Okay. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, again, let me emphasize it is, it is somewhat restrictive to just work with the set of conformal transformations. And, um, and, and, you know, this will lead to actually two particular problems, which uh, we will uh, discover later on, but uh, for which I will also then propose a solution. So it's a very important point here. Thanks. Okay, so uh, let me continue with this paper of Caputo and Magan. And uh, so the, the complexity they define also in exact analogy to, to uh, Nielsen, except they now take their, their cost function as just defined on the page before. And um, okay, so as I emphasize, we can now make use uh, of the Virasoro group structure, and in particular, every unitary operator uh, U of T will be associated with an element of the Virasoro group. And uh, so it's a group in a mathematical sense, uh, as is written for the transformations at the um, end of the line, as you can see the transformations U. Okay, so as I said, we, we use uh, the conformal transformations uh, as acting on the circle times the line. And so uh, any conformal transformation will be denoted by F and it's written in these coordinates as you can see there with the sigma. And then, of course, the group product is mean, it means that we act uh, with uh, two functions, with one function or other, one transformation on the next. Okay, and then uh, Caputa and Magan putting everything together, so inserting now this uh, conformal transformations into all these equations which I shown to you, and, in, and the complexity given at the uh, top of the page. Then they end with this last line, which you see there. So uh, they find a result for the complexity, which involves the central charge. <coughs> it involves a transformation F. So uh, dot is a time derivative and F uh, primes the derivative with respect to sigma. 
and then um, the, the highest weight is involved and the last term in the curly bracket is the Schwarzian derivative. So that's what they have. Okay, so now let's move on from, from this result. <clears throat> so now um, um, there's this very nice geometric structure which we can use and this will lead us to, to the so-called core adjoint orbits. So let me explain what these are. So the idea is to write this complexity <clears throat> function which I just showed to you in terms of group theory and for this we use the dictionary which is now given on this page. So um, the gates, they uh, will be mapped to elements X of the Virasovo algebra and the states, they will be mapped to elements V of the dual space um, to the Virasovo algebra. And then the expectation values um, mean uh, will be mapped to the application of um, one element of the co um, of the dual space to the um, to the Virasovo algebra. So we apply v to x essentially. So uh, this is a translation of this uh, physical terms into mathematical terms, which then makes this uh, symmetry structure rather obvious. So now there will be two slides a little more mathematical, um, but then I will show you some examples uh, after that. So, um, so what's going to happen is that a Virasovo group element G acts on a gate X uh, by the adjoint transformation, which you can see there. So um, it's, um, you know, it's what you normally know also from the adjoint representation essentially with acting from the left and the right. And then um, for the stage V, we will have a co-adjoint transformation um, as defined in the second equation on this slide. Okay, and so now what is the co-adjoint orbit? So that's a set of states V that is reachable uh, through co-adjoint transformations on a particular fixed state V node. And uh, so uh, it's convenient to take V naught to be the um, highest weight state because then essentially if you consider the Virasovo group, then the co-adjoint orbit will give you precisely one gamma module of your conforming group. And uh, so that's the space O which we have uh, written there. Okay, so now one important geometric fact is that this uh, co-adjoint orbit um, is associated to a symplectic form. So a symplectic form is something uh, which you can define on phase spaces and which has a lot of applications in classical mechanics and uh, for, here for geodesics and this will show up later as well. And uh, so this symplectic form is called omega and it's uh, uh, written there. So. Uh, um, now you can um, insert all these various quantities. So V is again an element of um, the dual to the Virasovo algebra. And then um, this theta of G is the so-called Mora Corton form. So if you want to know this name, but okay. So essentially what you have to remember is that we have this particular symplectic form which is associated to this orbit. And then um, you can actually define the so-called geometric action. So now this is written in red. Uh, which is essentially the uh, integral over this form alpha. And, uh, and then for this alpha, we just insert what we have in the first line, and uh, then we get this expression involving this co-adjoint action. Okay, so um, that looks uh, rather mathematical, but I'm going to show you some examples very shortly. So, um, now, one important result is that um, this, the, the complexity which I just discussed before, so which I so this complexity action which I um, which I introduced before, is exactly equivalent to this geometric action. The only thing is one has to be a little careful about um, uh, the central expansion, and uh, so this is one new result of our paper compared to the Caputo and Magan that we were very careful of. Um, including the central extension. And uh, this plays an important role if you want this exact match. And then later there will be also an issue of gauge invariance, which I'm going to come to shortly. And um, so uh, the central extension comes from the fact uh, in mathematical terms that the, as you read on the last line, the representations of the Virasov group uh, by unitary operators includes a phase. 
So you see this equation at the top, uh, at the bottom right of the slide, where you see a phase in this uh, group transformation, and this phase is precisely related to um, the central extension. So in the Caputa and Magan paper, this was uh, the first factor was actually set to one, but um, for for really getting this exact map, it should be allowed to vary. Okay, so now with this mathematical framework, um, we can actually calculate this uh, geometric action for the Virasova group. Now that's been done a long time ago by Alexeyev and Shatashvili, so this is actually uh, perfectly unrelated to complexity. So they calculated this uh, geometric action using uh, the quadrant orbit and the synthetic form precisely for the Virasova group, where V0, uh, again, is a state which determines a particular coadjoint orbit, and you should think of this as being the highest weight state. And F, again, is a particular conformal transformation. Okay, so this is an action. So um, to obtain the optimal path with the lowest cost, uh, we need to minimize this action, which means that we have to solve the equations of motion. Okay. And uh, so let me tell you that the equation of motion for this action, which is written at the top of the page, is the equation which is at the bottom. And uh, so this is, if you look at this uh, differential equation, you actually see that it's an equation for a harmonic oscillator uh, for this variable f dot over f prime. Okay. So, um, okay, so let's look at now at some solutions to, to this equation. Okay, and now um, at this stage, we find it's maybe slightly disappointing result because we don't really get anything very non-trivial from this. So um, a particular solution for, um, for this uh, equation of motion, which you get from this geometric action is given by this function f, uh, which is written in the first equation of the slide. And uh, so it's two conformal transformations, one after the other, g and f naught. And they have the following properties. So G is independent of T. And uh, F node only generates a phase when it's applied to a reference state, to the reference state, which is our highest weight state. So essentially what you get um, for, your, um, for your gate or your transformation, it's made out of two transformations, UG and UF zero. But um, unfortunately this UF zero is it just means you multiply your state in the Hilbert space by a phase, which is not a very physical transformation. And the second step is actually ins an instantaneous jump because it's independent of time. But as I said before, what we actually would like is that the complexity grows linearly in time. And in this case, that's not going to happen and it just instantaneously jumps to the target state up to a phase. Okay. So we have this beautiful uh, geometrical action but um, the solution is uh, slightly simplistic. And of course, um, this is due to the fact that we restricted ourselves very much to a particular uh, type of transformations and, and uh, uh, states. Um, OK, so um, I will explain more about this in the next couple of slides. OK, so first of all, there is an issue of gauge invariance in boundary terms. So, um, if you take your highest weight state H and uh, on act on it, essentially with an operator which just contains the Virasova operator L0, then this will only lead to a phase change because this is an eigenstate of L0. Um, on the other hand, the on shell value of this geometry action is not invariant under these gauge transformations. And in fact, um, there are some particular boundary terms which have to be taken into account. So when we evaluate the complexity, uh, we, we have to restore the gauge invariant um, by including these boundary terms. And um, then if we do that, then actually um, we find that the complexity for a phase change vanishes. And that's of course reassuring because uh, there was no physical change in the state. If we take, just take a Hilbert space state and multiply it by a phase, then the physics doesn't change. So obviously then also there's no complexity associated with that. So everything is consistent, but it's not very revealing uh, so far. Okay, so let me show you this in an example. As a, so now we see this function f naught, which is this phase change. 
um, which is a solution to this uh, harmonic oscillator equation, which we get from this geometric action for the Euler solar algebra. And uh, so this, we, we just take a function sigma plus delta of t, and actually this gives, this delta of t gives the coefficient of uh, the L naught generator in, in, um, in the gate. So essentially, uh, since the reference state H is the highest weight state, it's an L0 eigenstate. And then, um, so essentially when you apply this transformation, then essentially the only thing that happens is that H uh, changes by a phase as you see. And then uh, if you calculate the complexity by inserting everything into the uh, expression which I gave to you, you get this result in the middle of the page. So it depends uh, on the highest weight state and this difference of delta at the final and the initial time. And then you can actually show that um, in, if you include this boundary term from this um, geometric action, which is written there with F being the in, capital F being the inverse of little f, then you can actually make this term in the middle of the page to, to vanish. And uh, so this is our example for this phase transformation. Okay, so um, we see that for the Virasova group, uh, everything is consistent, um, everything is beautiful, but um, our set somehow of uh, transformations is too restrictive to get a non-trivial result. So um, the situation changes somewhat for the better if we look at katz moody groups, as we will now do next. So this means now we will consider a Virasova group plus an additional symmetry with um, a current J. And uh, just to remind you, I've written a katz moody algebra on the first equation on the slide. And uh, so this is um, essentially you um, add to the Virasova algebra this extra algebra, which, of which, which are also transformed covariantly under conformal transformations. And again, this algebra has a central extension with a coefficient k, which you can see there. And uh, so now, as we, I will show you, these additional generators j now provide some structure such that, so now you can actually play the same as, game as before. You um, construct the complexity. You show it's equivalent to the geometric action in this case as well. And, uh, and then you write down the equation of motion and you solve them. And now these transformations which solve these equation of motion do indeed lead to non-trivial target states and also to a non-vanishing complexity. And it's also linear in time as we expect or would like. Okay, so let me show you what uh, happens in this case. So uh, in this case, the gates uh, Q of T are given by the second but last uh, equation on the slide. So it's very similar to what we were doing before, except we now replace the energy momentum tensor by this conserved current J. And then the complexity functional is again, this integral over the cost function. So we take the same cost function as before. And then uh, what uh, we get is this expression, which you see in the last line. So um, there's some resemblance, of course, with the Westerino written action as you would expect. And so phi is now the highest weight state um, of this uh, katz moody algebra, or a highest factor of this katz moody algebra. Okay, so now by repeating this mathematical analysis I showed to you, then you also get a geometric action. Uh, and again, you have to be very careful about the central extension. So in this equation, which you now see on the first line, um, you, you see again this um, poor joint orbit, and then the second term is indeed the central extension which again, so the last term with this m theta g, this uh, is again, involves this uh, Maurer carton symplectic form. And uh, B0 labels uh, the orbit, so which in this sense means it, this corresponds to the web of the conserved current for, of your Katsumi group. Okay, and then uh, what you can do, you, you, you can write this, um, um, action now in terms of a symmetry transformation, so which in um, analogy to Westerlin Witten model is, is called omega of t and sigma. And then uh, you get this expression, which is the last uh, equation for the complexity on the slide. And you now see that the first term is the one I wrote before, but now uh, there's a second or a last term involving also k, um, which um, reflects the central extension. And um, again, if you include this term in the complexity functional, then uh, 
agrees exactly again as before. Okay, so now let me show you uh, two examples <clears throat> to show where things become slightly less trivial than in the Virasuro case. So, <clears throat> <coughs> sorry, if you look at the paper, you will see that we have that we have uh, several uh, Katsumudi groups. We have uh, also SL two R and SL N R. So, but here let me stick to SU two for now. And um, so first. Let me show that um, you can also get such a trivial phase change as in the virus rule case. And that happens, for instance, if you consider a uh, transformation omega uh, as the one which is given at the top of the slide. So which has two matrices, one depending on sigma and one depending on t. Now, uh, for the third uh, calculation, let me just point out that this is a special case of a more general matrix, matrix written in terms of parameters alpha and beta, which you see at the top right corner. So if you choose alpha to be just sigma, then you recover the first matrix. And if you re uh, choose beta to be 2 pi t, then you re recover the second matrix in the first expression. Now, if you take this omega and insert precisely into this complexity geometric action, which I showed to you, and then you get this result, which you see there. So it's 2 pi kt, where k is the coefficient of the central extension of the Katsumudi algebra, and t is the time at the final uh, when you reach the reference state. Uh, sorry, when you reach the target state, of course, when you reach the target state. And the target state is now written in the second line. And um, <clears throat> uh, as you can see, the target state, which uh, uh, is associated to the symmetry transformation, uh, involves this operator J03, and of which um, the state HJ max, which was our, um, our reference state, is actually an eigenstate. So again, it just means uh, this transformation just multiplies the original state with a phase, so J max is just a number. And uh, then now here, I just wanted to show you once how this boundary term, which you get from this geometric action looks like. So this is the last but one equation on the slide. So um, if you do the calculation carefully and um, use this geometric action, then there's a boundary contribution, which is written there, which uh, cont contains a derivative of beta and a derivative of sigma. Uh, sorry, of alpha and uh, beta and alpha now are given us on the first line. And then in this example where you take the transformation omega, which is on the top left of the page, then this boundary term is exactly minus the result for the complexity. And so again, your complexity is zero, as it should, because you just did a phase transformation. Okay, however, now there's in for the Katsumuni group, um, there is enough structure to also get uh, something which is less trivial. And uh, an example for such a non-trivial transformation is the one which is now shown at the top right. So you see it's a little more involved and has a number of parameters. And if you calculate the complexity for this transformation, again using the geometric action, then you get this expression C is equal to alpha times beta times k so times t, where t is the final time and uh, k is the coefficient of the central extension of the Katsumudi algebra. And in this case, you actually, um, the transformation is more, more involved because the target state is actually the operator j um, uh, 2 um, acting on this, um, this um, original highest wedge state h j max. So, and then uh, if you evaluate this, then you actually find that your target state is a sum of states with different values of J max, so it's not an eigenvalue. And um, so the, and accordingly, uh, the complexity now is non-trivial, so it's the one given on the second, in the second equation on the slide. And in this time, you can't remove this by the boundary term. So this is indeed a finite um, gauge invariant result. And it's associated, so you have a non transmittal transformation from a reference to a target state, and um, your complexity is linear in time and it's finite. So this is nice, and um, it's so this demonstrates that we can do something non trivial with this approach. However, of course, we should note that, um, of course, our approach is somewhat non universal because we cannot just take any arbitrary state and do something useful for it. So this should be taken kept in mind. 
Okay, um, I see time is going forward, but I think I will be done in about five minutes from now. I hope this goes okay. Um, okay, um, so the last thing I wanted to mention very briefly is that, okay, so obviously just doing conformal transformations within one lemma module um, is not going to give you a non-trivial uh, complexity. <laughs> So uh, this means that uh, in this approach, which we are doing, we have to modify the cost function, which contributes to the complexity. And uh, so here uh, we have some preliminary results on an approach, which was also first mentioned by Caputo and Magan, which is to use the so-called Euler-Arnold method. So again, um, uh, Euler and Arnold, of course, are extremely famous for their work <laughs> in different centuries, but <laughs> Lots of different countries, and uh, so they're um, they're very famous for um, for their work on classical mechanics and um, in, in a more mathematical approach. And so um, we already saw this when we talked about the symplectic form that this this can play an important role. Okay, so um, the idea of this approach is to define a metric on um, on on a lead group of a gate set. And then we use the Euler Arnold methods to derive the uh, geodesics with respect to this method, metric. Okay, so uh, the Euler Arnold method means that uh, one minimizes the energy functional via the Hamilton equations. And so now uh, the cost function has a slightly different interpretation than uh, the one we had before, because um, now the cost function measures the length of representation vectors of conformal transformations. And um, so, but the, the main advantage of this approach is now that um, the optimal parts are obtained, um, by, are obtained by application of gates containing all the generators of the visual solar group and not just um, L0. Okay, so in this previous approach, it was essentially only L0 contributing and that was a partially a reason for, for the triviality of the results that we're getting. But uh, with this uh, Euler-Arnold approach, which modifies modifies the the cost function, uh, then um, we can get uh, much more non-trivial behavior also for the villa solo group. Okay, um, we didn't evaluate this in full detail. However, if we write the complexity action based on this new cost function. Then uh, as equation of, of motion, we obtain this equation, which is written in the first line. So epsilon is again, um, this uh, coefficient function of in the gate. Um, and um, in, this is now a very well known equation where actually V, uh, epsilon is then interpreted as a, as a velocity V. And uh, this goes under the name of Kortovic with this equation. And uh, so this is a very no, well-known exactly solvable partial differential equation, which describes uh, shallow waterways if we identify our um, parameter function epsilon with the velocity. Okay, so then we looked at some uh, class of solutions. And um, so, this, so, so as I said, this equation, well, it's nonlinear, but it can be solved um, analytically. And one class of solutions are these modal waves which involve Jacobi elliptic functions. So this is given by this equation at the bottom. And so there you see this Jacobi elliptic function and then K is an elliptic integral of the first kind, but then there's a large number of parameters. And so we have tunable parameters um, which we can use. And uh, so uh, Marios and Annalena, they calculated the Fourier transform of this um, solution. And that confirmed that all the um, um, with also generators contributed with a tunable parameter. And so then now we have a chance of uh, doing much more non-tunable transformations also for, um, for the GSO algebra. And okay, so this is certainly an approach to follow for the future. Okay, so in my last two minutes, let me say very quickly um, a few things about relations to the ads cf 2 correspondence, essentially by mentioning two classes of papers. Um, so this is essentially an open question, but there are some interesting facts to note here. So first, I would like to point out these papers by Miklai and Flori, and also Mario Flori uh, later continued on this. And uh, so this is, these are papers um, on the gravity side of the ADS-CFT correspondence, where they considered both the complexities action and complexity is equal to volume proposals. 
And um, so they study uh, the change of these complexities under perturbatively small conformation transformations of ADS3. And they indeed find that um, the change of complexity on the uh, change of the vacuum state is non-vanishing. So uh, that's what all the field theory attempts should eventually match, of course. Okay, and some other set of papers I would like to mention is the fact that these quadrant orbits, they also have already been considered on the gravity side by the authors uh, written on the first line there. And uh, so they, they studied the mapping of the quadrant orbits to the gravity side of the ads cft correspondence, and they found this interesting classical, uh, classification uh, depending on the uh, highest weight states. So, uh, there's an exceptional case when h is equal to zero, which is then the vacuum, and then they find that this orbit is exactly ADS3. And uh, so then there's other uh, situations when h uh, minus c over 24 is less than zero or larger than zero. In one case, you get the conical defect, and in the other case, you get the, black, the BTZ black hole. And um, so that's very interesting. And now in view of ADS-CFT, an open question is, of course, that the field theory cost function must be chosen such so that these um, proposals are um, reproduced on the gravity side. And um, uh, it's not simple probably, but uh, certainly at least it's a very definite question to look for. Okay, so that brings me to the end. So uh, I showed to you that uh, complexity functions can be taken to agree exactly with geometrical actions on, uh, on four joint orbits. And this can be done both for the Virasoro, uh, sorry, there was a, a type of Virasoro and Katsumuri group, sorry, conformal should be Katsumuri there. Okay, uh, one point I didn't have time to talk about, but it's also interesting is that um, this uh, approach of the geometric action also coincides with yet another approach to um, complexity in quantum field theory, which is based on past integrals. So this is due to Takainagi and collaborators. Um, so um, there's also interesting things to see there. Then I showed to you that within the same Verma module, um, essentially we only get trivial results. Um, so um, in particular, the computation uh, takes zero time. And, um, and uh, so then there's also only these phase shifts, which would be phase transition. I think I was already a little disgusted when I wrote in conclusion this way. Next type also, it should be uh, um, this just a space transformation, not transition. Okay. okay, on the other hand, for uh, Katsumudi groups, um, we found that there's sufficient structure to generate non trivial complexities and which are linear in time, and uh, they also gauge invariant. So that's already uh, a very nice reassuring result. And for the uh, Virasuo algebra, we suggest to look closer um, at this Euler Arnold approach to define a modified cost function. And I also, at the end, uh, very briefly mentioned new possibilities for maps to ADS3. So this concludes my talk. So I, I, I hope I showed you that. Okay, so the big goal is to define complexity for interacting quantum field theory, and uh, not only interacting, but strongly coupled to field theories. And this is certainly a very difficult task. But I think with this entire approach, it's very promising, at least for theories with a lot of symmetries, to make progress um, beyond um, the the um, free field approaches, which are already known. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my presentation, and I hope there's still time for a few questions. Thank you very much. Okay, Yogana, thank you very much for your valuable talk. Thank you. Thank you. Any question, please? I have a small question about the, the first uh, quantum circuit uh, associated to the first geometric action which you showed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if you associated uh, the past integral to this quantum circuit, wouldn't it be uh, one loop exact because of the, the synthetic structure and uh, disturbance hectum theorem or something uh, like that? Let me quickly show the slide. You mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. the action which comes, uh, yeah, this oh, action. Okay. This is a very good question. Uh, well, that would be wonderful if it were true. Um, okay, I have to confess I didn't think about it, but it's an excellent suggestion, so we should definitely try that. Um, I, yeah, I mean, uh, given this, I mean, since, since there is a relation to the positive approach, um, 
yeah, I think this should should work, um, but I would have to think in detail about how exactly this to do, to do this. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so, uh, also it's, it's not obvious to me. Uh, uh, will will this actually be useful uh, for uh, for anything? Because uh, as I understand from your talk, complexity uh, the way you study it is purely classical, right? Uh, so it's just a classical action. Uh, but, well, okay. Um, not quite. Okay, so let me go back to the beginning. So, okay, I, well. But as, in, and as I understand, Bishka, uh, the local, localization works also for classical action. I mean, it's uh, determined Ekman uh, localization. Yeah, okay. You do not need to be, the action do not need to be quantum. In fact. Well, okay, but I mean, I, I'm not sure I entirely agree. It's entirely classical. I mean, y y yes, I mean, of course, you could view this as classical, but nevertheless, uh, remember that there's this path ordering involved. So um, um, I do think, you know, if you have a collection of operators here, um, you could probably make sense of this also in a quantum context. But um, I totally agree, this needs to be investigated in more detail. But uh, um, I, I think due to the inclusion of the path interval, you could view this probably also as a quantum computation. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, you're gonna prob can you connect to, uh, for example, two excited states given by different primaries? For example, for H and uh, some another Cayman dimension H bar? Uh, not yet. Okay, that's another extension which would be extremely useful to do. So, okay, so um, as I mentioned, in, in so far we only consider that we move within one Verma module which is given by one highest wedge that H. But uh, of course, that's a natural extension to do is to look at other transformations which take you from H to H prime and see if we get something non trivial there. And yeah, certainly that, that's a very good idea to do this, uh, but we haven't done it yet. But uh, that, that should be possible relatively. Straightforwardly, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. More questions, please. Uh, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Oh, please. Uh, so, Joanna, can you extend this approach to a perturbation to CFT, like perturbatively? Um, well, in principle, I would think yes. I mean, of course, as you can see, uh, so far, it relied extremely on the use of right. conformal symmetry, <laughs> but um, of course, if it depends on, yeah, I think you could probably think of some simple deformation where um, um, you... Now, I was just thinking of the deformation being very small uh, at a perturbative level, so you could still use CFT techniques too. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's a super interesting suggestion. I, I, to be honest, I haven't thought about this, but uh, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't see a reason why it shouldn't work. I mean, uh, certainly um, one can certainly uh, try this. And um, okay, I think the first step would be to find a, a simple perturbation, maybe yeah. take something marginal at first to see what happens. And uh, okay. I would say it's an interesting suggestion. I don't see why it shouldn't work, but I, 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 to be honest, I haven't thought about this at all, but I, I don't see a really major problem why it shouldn't work, except okay. that it becomes rather complicated. Perhaps. But, uh, let's see. Thank you. Thanks. I have, I have uh, two questions, one very basic, uh, and that is uh, when you go from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory, don't you expect that this quantity complexity should be infinity and you have to renormalize or I don't know, at least do normal ordering to get some finite answer? Yeah, yeah, okay, so, um, right, okay, I would say, again, uh, the normal ordering is included in this path ordering which we have at the beginning. Um, however, of course, um, you know, this deserves really uh, very careful study, but um, again, as the same reply as I had before, I think this um, um, path ordering would probably um, do the job of the normal ordering as well. Um, okay. Uh, I think so. But of course, yes, um, um, one could of course take a different approach and say, okay, I, let me introduce a, a cutoff in the entire story and uh, 
see what happens then. And uh, that's certainly also a very good question um, to consider. Um, if, uh, you know, if we take um, um, smear this with a Gaussian or something like this in, the, in this gate, I mean, this is also an approach one could probably take. And I have also a short question, Johanna, at the end. I mean, so do you have, is it known what is the dual uh, ADS3 for theories that uh, incorporate Katsumudi algebras? Uh, yes, but not the ones we looked at right now. <laughs> yeah, oh. so they are very good question. Uh, hello, Kobe, by the way. <laughs> so, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, so, um, of course, there are quite a lot of known examples of ADS CFT and with an involving an ADS3 where there are some sigma models or um, there are some, some Katsumudi structures, but of course the groups are more involved. Uh, I mean, you can think of SL2R times SL2R, for instance, and okay, there should be other examples, again, like if you think of the D1, D5 system or, or things like this. Um, so, yes, there are uh, examples of ADS CFT duals uh, for Katsumudi algebras, but here we took really, really simple ones. So, we took SU2 <laughs> and we took mm -hmm. uh, SL2R. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. these, right. these are too simple, but um, it's a very good suggestion, and I think that should be done next. Uh, maybe we should look at these uh, um, CFTs that appear in, in, in the ADS CFT correspondence, like the D1, D5 system, and see if we can do this analysis there. That's certainly an excellent suggestion. Okay. I have a comment. Thank you. I have a comment to make. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, hello. As sir. you know that, uh, hello, hi, <laughs> uh, Joanna. <laughs> uh, you see, uh, as you know that the action of uh, uh, Alexei evans Atashvili Yes. the co-joint orbit of the Virasoro group uh, yes. under some special circumstance can be mapped into uh, Polyakov's action for two-dimensional gravity. Yes, uh, very yes. good question. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, so very good point. Um, sorry, were you done or? Yes, no, okay. I feel it. And uh, of course, uh, this, this action this of Polyakov gravity essentially uh, gives you uh, a very, uh, a very trivial theory, actually, unless you add a cosmological type of constant, uh, depending on the metric that you get from the uh, Alexeyev uh, Satashvili action. And with some boundary terms, uh, this, uh, uh, this action then uh, reproduces the, the, uh, the, uh, the geometric action uh, of the SYK model, that is the uh, Schwarzschild. I just wanted to make this comment, actually, whether there is any connection uh, to, you know, complexity theory and getting an action for the SYK model. So yeah, yeah, no, it's a very imp important remark. And so I should, should say uh, two things. So in this paper by Caputa and Magan, they do actually study the Polyakov action and uh, they do point out exactly what you just said. Um, yes, uh, so that's a good point. And uh, I mean, similarly, um, I mean, this is something I, I didn't discuss for lack of time for the Vesemine, um, for the uh, Katsumudi case, we get um, the, the standard West amino written action, um, um, so which would be uh, the analogy to the Polyakov action. And uh, yes, the, uh, the connection to the SYK model is also very interesting. And I think there were some recent papers which now, I think was also by Saskin just before Christmas, um, where they analyzed um, um, this action in, in relation to, to the SYK model. And that, that's another very interesting direction. Yeah, thank you very much for pointing this out. Yes. Okay. There is another question by Javier Mangan. Okay. I have a question. Hi, Anna. Hello, Javier. Hello, how are you? Uh, when you use the, the central stage, the, the central extension uh, in the paper in the instantaneous gate, that part always belongs to the stabilizer group of the instantaneous gate because that part never modifies the state. No, it's proportional to the identity and never yes. changes the yes, state. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it is therefore a gate transformation from the point of view of the coadjoint orbit formulation of the problem. Yes. But we know that gate transformation do, although they modify the global action because they have boundary terms, they do not modify the solutions of the equations of motion. So I mean that is that I have more arguments to argue that 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 our action is the same as the as the which I'm not going to comment here, 
but that is uh, I, I just wanted I think uh, uh, although the although although the equations or motions that uh, that you get from a geometric action in which you include the the central station can be very different from those in which you don't include them the the actual solutions uh, I think they should be the same and actually that is what uh, in all this as why business basically they do and 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 also to in all this uh, when you compute uh, the expectation value of the um, i mean when you compute the polyac of action for example as the as the generating function of the stress tensor it it it, it is always this kind of arguments that uh, although although including the central term might modify uh, some global aspects of the action it won't modify the the local the local ones yeah, that, that's for certainly true. I think the argument here is that um, we need to include these boundary terms to um, to get something gauge invariant. Okay, so um, okay, so uh, uh, hi, uh, it's nice to, to see you. Maybe we, we should, we should Skype just you and I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I okay. Don't I, I, get too long, <laughs> but uh, let, let me just say for, very quickly for everybody. So let me find my. Um, um, Okay, so here, yeah, okay, so uh, just very quickly. So, um, you know, so if you represent the Verso group by um, unitary op operators, then there's this phase. And, and this phase is related to the central extension. And I think um, in your paper, you set this to one. <laughs> No, no, yeah, no, no. I, I did, we didn't set it to, to zero. We, we said that it always. I mean, basically, uh, when you consider in the complexity uh, in the complexity story, that is a that is a you can you can consider it as a term that is proportional to the identity, and therefore you you would say that 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 has a zero cost because you are not doing anything. But actually, that has a a, a good map into the coadjoint orbit story because in the coadjoint orbit, that those kind of terms always belong to the stabilizer group. Because they they are they are proportional to the identity and they always belong to the to the yeah they are gauge transformations in in the coadjoint orbit. So although you get very different actions, I agree they are they are very different looking actions. Uh, uh, the and and actually they, the, they 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 you get different global complexities. The solutions uh, should I, I think they should be the same. We can discuss we can discuss later. I don't want it yeah, just. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, so so yeah, of course here the statement we want to make was about uh, the complexities. Okay, so but certainly locally that's a different story. Yes, um, I agree. Yes, but I, I would be very happy to talk to you at some point. And um, yeah, thanks for joining. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think there is another question. Okay, just the last one, please. Okay, there is a question from Aranya. Uh, okay, please. Uh, can I drink a whole lot of genetic factors? Oh, Aranya, I, I can't hear you very well. Um, you can't hear, sorry. Uh, I think there the the is a question in the chat. Okay, sorry, I didn't understand. I mean, just technically, I mean, just... Okay, you can uh, read it in chat, or uh, I can read it loud. Uh, can you please read the question? Yeah, so they ask uh, that uh, you didn't talk about penalty factors and tolerance in this picture, and uh, what would they correspond uh, in, in here? Ah, okay, very good question. Um, so um, I mean, okay, yeah, of course, the penalty factors are probably associated to to the to the cost function, but uh, yeah, the, the tolerance uh, that's that's the region I mean, uh, you know, in Q theory maybe. Uh, okay, so the, so the the tolerance of course comes from this original idea of doing this, um, you know, in setups relevant to experiment, and if we just have an analysis within conformity theory, that's maybe not the first thing you think about. Um, of course, the penalty factors, they probably um, enter the cost function in some way, but I didn't think about how exactly, but it's a very good point and, you know, we should think about this. Um, uh, it's again, it's a very good question, but um, okay, I haven't any answer right now for this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, as I see, there is no more questions, correct? Yes. Okay. If no more questions, let's thanks.
Yagan, once again, thank you very much for your valuable talk and for lovely discussion. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure.